Tell me if that's on. Is it working? Okay. Wow. If you all had known me 10 years ago, I did not sing. I mean, I would sit in church and I'd hold and I would, I would whisper the words. I didn't even, I didn't know how to sing. Um, I still don't know how, but I didn't realize there was, there was something from my past that stopped me from being able to praise God, and it was pride, and that is literally a demon. Um, its name is actually Leviathan. Job chapter 41 talks about it, but it stops you from praising God. Even if you want to, it'll be in your heart, but you can't get it. It's like it chokes off the channel between the head and the heart. But when I heard that song... <laughs> And I know you all know this. It was like I was listening and I thought, how did God know? I was back there in the back an hour ago and the Lord told me, Eric, show the first, the ending slide from the last message when you start this one. And I thought, well, that doesn't, how do I make that connect? And the Lord was like, just trust me. I'll, I'll take care of that. And I got, they got up and just sang that song and the words to that song are the last slide. What it's talking about. Listen to what that says. I mean, I almost started crying when he was singing that. Let me find it here. My sin, oh, the joy of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but in whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Hallelujah. If you have an opportunity... If you all have an opportunity, how many people have heard of that book, Pilgrim's Progress? Okay, have you ever tried to read the original? I mean, it can, yeah. And it does, like Pastor Skeet said, it will exercise your mind trying to speak the old English. There is a Seventh-day Adventist man named Jim Pappas, P-A-P-A-S. He did, and it's not an abridged version. He even tells in the front, he said, I did not take anything whatsoever away from the original. I just took the words and made them a little bit more of what we would say in modern English. And I'd never read it. I bought it for my daughter. She loves to read. My son is not a reader. He likes math and science. Bought it for my daughter. She finished the whole book in less than one week. Could not put it down. And then my son, somehow she persuaded him to try it he finished it in two weeks. My son does not enjoy reading. He finished the book, and he came to me and was like, Dad, you got to read this. If you go online, you can buy the book for sometimes $8.99, but it's, it's the new amplified Pilgrim's Progress by Jim Pompas. And you can read it even to your children if they're five years old, and they will not get bored. And I, I looked it up just out of curiosity to see if Ellen White had anything to say. Yes, she does. She said Bunyan was inspired by God with that book. Hallelujah. Okay, I better grab my Bible. This, this weekend has been such a blessing. And, uh, and I thank you all for staying. I mean, I could, I could be at home or, or at whoever's house I'm staying at this evening, and don't worry about it. But I know what it's like to struggle in bondage to sin. And I'm not completely free yet. I shouldn't say that. Christ has set me free. I just have not appropriated that freedom yet. So I am still walking by faith just like you are. It was finished at Calvary. That's why Jesus said it's finished. Paid in full. And now he's asking us to appropriate that which he has already accomplished as our own. Now I want to show you something. This is the last slide that I was going to end with earlier. This is from Ellen White. I want to encourage you, jot this down. Look up this quote, and then look up First Selected Messages, page 395 and 396, maybe 397. Read that this week, and you'll understand why. Jesus is the only hope of the soul. Do you know how the Bible says that hope maketh not ashamed? Do you know what the word hope is in Greek in that verse? It means the things that you have been given confidence of and you have assurance for. It doesn't mean I hope so. It means I'm sure this is going to happen because God promised it. Jesus is the only hope or assurance we have for the soul. By faith, every soul may say with the psalmist, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. 
Now, this changed my life. I'm not talking about 10, 12 years ago. This changed my life a year ago when I read this. Maybe two years. The moment the sinner lays hold of Christ by faith, that moment your sins are no longer upon you. That moment. Christ stands in the sinner's place. That means as your substitute and surety. And declares. This is what she said. And declares, I have borne your guilt. I have been punished for your transgressions. I have taken your sins and put my righteousness upon you. In Christ, you remember I told you that earlier, yesterday and today, that phrase, in Christ. In Christ, the sinner stands what? Guiltless. I'm guilty. I've done something wrong. I've been forgiven, but that doesn't change the fact that I did it, right? If you've been a convicted felon, I mean, you can go and apply for a job and they go, look, you've been pardoned. You paid the, I believe it, but you're still guilty of what you did. God doesn't work that way. The moment you believe that Jesus carried your sins and took them away on himself, that moment you stand guiltless. You've never done that bad thing. And people go, that's not, that's not possible. Well, of course it is. It's God. In Christ, the sinner stands guiltless before the law of God. Hallelujah. Not in part, but in whole. Now, I'm going to go to the, the next one. And we will pick up there. So if you guys can switch that over for me up top. It's amazing because the Lord connected this with a song. I had no idea. Now listen to this. Third angel's message is the last message to the world, right? And Ellen White said the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. And people say, no, no, no. She said justification by faith. And, and we as Adventists, we've done exactly what the Pharisees did. We have become so, we strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. We make it so theological that a common person can't even begin to understand it. Let me tell you something. I was that person. And I was like, yeah, justification is the work of a moment, but sanctification is the work of a lifetime. I had heard that so many times, and I was like, and God was like, Eric, forget about what you've heard. I don't care who it's from. Look it up. And I was like, what do you mean? God was like, look up the word justified. I went through the entire Old Testament and the entire New Testament. I looked up every single place where the word justified or justification is used. Guess what justified means? Declared and rendered innocent, pure, holy, righteous, and perfect. I was like, that's justified. That's why Paul said, therefore, being justified by faith, we now have peace with God. And I was like... Yeah, but God, you can't do that. And God was like, well, Eric, and I'm like, yeah, but I sinned yesterday. I'm not, I'm not innocent. He was like, well, how long do you want to carry that sin? And I'm like, I don't want to. He said, then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the moment you believe that Christ did what he said he did, it's yours. But you have to believe. And I was like, how do I make myself believe? And God said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So if I'm struggling with believing that a sin was forgiven, I don't need to read Daniel chapter 11 about the little horn or the big horn or the north, king of the north. I don't need to read Ezekiel 28. I, I need to read the promises of God's forgiveness. And as you read them out loud, your faith will grow. You have to read it out loud. It changes things. I challenge you. Try it for seven days. Every time you read the Bible or you read a, a book from Ellen White, read it out loud for seven days and just see what God does. I promise you, you will be amazed at what happens. And I love Brother Randy Skeet. I remember the first time I saw him preach, I was like, he didn't even open his Bible. I mean, he had it open, but he wasn't even looking at it. And I was like, man, I wish I could do that. And you know what's neat? 
And this is not for everybody. So I agree with what Brother Skeet was saying. We need to memorize the Word of God. I'm not good at memorization. But you know what God showed me? I, didn't even, I wasn't even trying. The more that I read because I was in so desperate need out loud, God said, the words I speak unto you are spirit and life. So as I was reading them out loud, His Spirit was writing them on my heart. Now, I can't just go flipping through a... a but you know what? When I need it, boom, it comes. I don't even know, mean to. But I've read it so much, it's already written there. I don't have to try to write it there. But read it out loud, and it will change everything. Listen to what the servant of the Lord said. If we would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ. Not know about Him. Remember Adam knew his wife Eve, and they became one flesh. You must know Christ and appropriate the gift of His righteousness. A husband can never know his wife if she's still wearing the veil. I mean, you understand, right? There is no intimacy. Even a kiss, which is an intimate, it's an act of worship. That's why they kiss the feet of idols. Soul ties can be formed through a kiss. I mean, I remember when I was a little boy and the first time I kissed a girl, I was like, man, the world is exploding. There was lights and, you know, I mean, literally, you all know what I'm talking about, right? Right? And I was like, oh, I mean, I was like 13 years old and I thought, man, the world has ended, you know? Do you know what's weird, though? That's why God wanted us to save our first kiss for our wife. The world would end and begin with that woman. I didn't know that. Do you know there's a reason why? And I'm, this is not about yoga. It is, but... You know, there's a reason why in the marriage vows, the pastor says you may now kiss the bride. You go, what do you mean now? I've been kissing her for the past four years. <laughs> what do you mean now? That's in there for a reason. Who is here to give the bride's hand in marriage? Well, I've been holding hands for years. Were well, you married? And people go, you're being legalistic. No, I'm not. By physical touch, there's connections made. And the greater the physical touch, the stronger the connection and the harder it is to break. And I told my little girl, I mean, I told her, I, I was like, man, I don't want to see her go down the road I went through, my little boy. Because I was not a good boy. Went to church every Sabbath, but I was not a God-fearing young man. I told my daughter, I said, Sierra, I said, if you save yourself for one man, I said, think about the gift that you're going to give to him and to yourself. The first time will be the only time. And I don't recommend Hollywood movies, but there was a film that was done by a Christian college in Virginia. It was called um, Patrick Henry College. The film is called Come What May. It's a Christian film. Make sure that if you look, it is the most powerful film I have ever seen on Christian purity. It was done by college students at this college. You will never regret seeing it. Come what may. And it was done at a, co a college called Patrick Henry College. It's a Christian film. Make sure because there's probably other films done by Hollywood that were with that name. But it says we must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness. What does it say righteousness is? A gift. Do you understand that? I didn't understand. I thought I did. I said I did. I was like, we don't, we don't believe in righteousness by works. Can, can God instantly say you're going to heaven? Well, you got to change your diet first. That's righteousness by works. You change your diet because God has saved you, not in order to be saved. You dress different because you know that you're now married to the Son of God. And you don't want to reveal the beauty that God has given you as a daughter of God to any other man but your husband. It's not in order to be saved, it's because you have been saved. That thief on the cross didn't have anything. He didn't have any instructions on what you got to do. Believe. And he believed and Jesus gave him assurance. You will be with me in paradise. But as Paul said, shall we can sin, continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we that are 
dead unto sin, continue to live in it. The reason I was struggling, I was struggling. Since I was a little boy, all the way until I was a grown man, I was struggling with lust, bad thoughts, okay, impure thoughts. I'm not talking about perversion, I'm just saying desire. A pretty lady would walk by and it was like, you know, I'm looking down and I'm gritting my teeth and I'm like, this cannot be Christianity. I'm not going to have any teeth left. I'm going to make it to heaven without any teeth. And you're laughing, but I'm serious. Have you ever felt that way? And I told the Lord, I was like, God, I've done this for so long. And this is not, Jesus wasn't down here on the cross going, man, I'd like to kill these guys, but I'm not going to do it. I was like, I want salvation. I want what Jesus had, what Paul had. I want to be free. When I quit drinking alcohol, I've never looked back. I don't walk by a beer store and go, oh, man, I really, it's hard to look away. I don't even think about it. Like, that stuff tasted like vomit. I was like, God, I want you to do that change in me about everything. And I called a man. He, he wasn't a member of our church, but I found an article that he had written online. And the article I knew the Lord had inspired. I mean, it spoke to my heart. And I said, I need to talk to this man. I called him. He was an older man, probably late 60s. Not older, but older than me. This was back 12 years ago. And I called him and I, I explained to him my problem. I said, look, the Lord has set me free from this. And he got me out of martial arts and, and Chinese mysticism. And he brought my wife and I back together. But I'm still battling like I was before. And he told me something I'll never forget. He said, Eric, he said, do you know why you're still struggling with that sin? I said, why? He said, because you're very much alive. And I was, and this is me, okay? I was still growing. I was like, oh, wow. It's another one of those ambiguous phrases. And I said, of course I'm alive. I'm talking to you. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, Eric, you're still very much alive. And I said, help me to understand. I said, I really want help. He said, okay. And I'm going to take, do you mind if I take a few minutes? And I, and I, if you have to get up and leave, get up and leave. I'm good because I don't leave till tomorrow morning. <laughs> so if I look up here and everybody's gone, I'll stop. <laughs> but I have to share this with you because it's important. It's not just important for you to go home with stuff in your head. There has to be something that's changed in here. This man told me, he said, Eric, he said, I want you to, I want you to think about this with me. We're going to use sanctified imagination for a minute. He said, I work at the hospital. You're one of the helpers there at the hospital. He said, I've got something that's going to be delivered to the fanciest hotel near you. Let's put it this way. The rooms are $500 a night for one bed, okay? It's an expensive hotel. He said, I'm sending you down there to pick up this package that's being delivered. So I get there, and I walk in, and I'm like, you know, there's 35, 50-foot ceilings and chandeliers that weigh, you know, half a ton and and I'm like, wow. I mean, they've got a convention center there. And I sit down. I go over and tell them, you know, when this package comes, please let me know. And I go and I sit down. And I'm just watching everything. You know, I'm just, wow. I don't stay in rooms like that. All of a sudden, I didn't realize it, but they were holding the Miss Universe pageant there that night. I'm sitting on the bench. And I look over to the right. And here's all these women, young women that come walking through in bikinis. And I'm like, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a, look down, look down. So I'm looking down at the floor, and I'm going, I am not going to look at that. What color was that that she was wearing? Do you understand what I'm saying? I was physically, the letter of the law, I was doing. I'm not going to look. But inside, the heart was still looking at what it was. Man, that, that was terrible. That blue. I mean, and I was like, that's me. And this man knew it. He said, Eric, so you're sitting there, and they walk through. He said, what happens to you? I said, well, I'm going to look down and fight with all of my power to resist that. He said, I know. He said, what happens to your body? I said, I probably start sweating. My heart rate increases. I know about the chemistry in the body. Your eyes are going to change. He said, okay. He said, now rewind. He said, you come back to the hospital with me. He said, I work in the morgue. I didn't tell you that. He said, um... No, I mean, he, he takes care of that. Listen for a second. So he sends me down to pick up the package, and he says, while you're sitting there, he said, I forgot something. 
And he said, so I jump in an ambulance, and he said, I bring this dead body of a man that died a week ago. We're waiting to, to, we've already taken the blood out of him, whatever. He's been in the cooler for a week. I mean, he's gone. He said, I put him on a uh, trolley or whatever, put him in the um, van or the ambulance. I drive back down there to you. He said, I push him in, in a, a wheelchair take him, and I set him down on the bench right beside you. And then I leave. He said, a few minutes, the door opens, here comes all those ladies in bikinis. He said, what happens to the man next to you? I was like, nothing. He said, that's because he's dead. (laughs) He said, the apostle Paul says, Romans 6, verse 10 and 11, in that Christ died, he died unto sin. Reckon ye also appropriate also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. He said, Eric, you'll never have victory this side of heaven until you learn and believe that you're dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. Ellen White says, you must know Christ. That means you're one with him and appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to the repentant sinner For the truth as it is in Jesus is the only means by which man may be delivered, set free, healed, and made whole. It's the only way. It's the only way. You have to see that when Christ died, you died. When he was raised, you were raised. This whole message is centered on that, and that's what yoga is a counterfeit of. And I'm going, to, I'm going to give you one more example just to help you to understand this. It took me two years. I had a Sabbath school teacher that was struggling to get our Sabbath school to understand this. And it took me two years. And I showed up every Sabbath, and I would, I would argue with him. And I'm not saying you need to argue with your Sabbath, but I'm saying I could not see it. And I was like, the Bible says this, and it says this, and it can't be that way. That's impossible. And then the Lord helped me to see it through an article by W.W. W. Prescott and three articles from Ellen White. And after he showed it to me, he gave me this illustration. Have you ever heard of a crack baby? You know what I'm talking about? What is, it? What is a crack baby? The mother's doing crack cocaine, and the baby is born a crack addict. The baby never did cocaine. The da- baby never had a choice, but it was born in sin. Now, let's say we live here in this area, rural community, and there's a lady. She's, uh, say she's 38 years old. Um, she's not a Christian, not a bad person, but she's not a Christian, and she's dating a, a young man, and she gets pregnant. And the young man's like, I'm not ready to be a daddy, and he walks away on her. She lives by herself in an apartment, a, a, like a two-story apartment building by herself, 20 minutes outside of town. Nobody lives near her. She wakes up in the morning. She's nine months pregnant. Okay? She's nine months pregnant. She wakes up in the morning. She goes into the kitchen, and she wants to make breakfast. So while she's making breakfast, she grabs a pack of cigarettes, and she starts smoking the cigarette. Is the baby smoking the cigarette? You sure? It's not a trick question. Are you sure? Okay, so she's smoking the cigarette. And she starts making her bacon and ham and spam and eggs and all that yummy stuff. Okay, so she finishes the cigarette, the stuff's still cooking, and she gets a cup of hot, heavy caffeinated coffee. And she's drinking that. Is the baby drinking the coffee? Why? And the baby is inside the mother. What the mother's doing, the baby's doing. Not by choice, but by reality. Do you understand? The mother eats her breakfast. She goes in, takes a shower. She's got one of those old porcelain bathtubs, the nice ones. You know what I mean? The ones from 100 years ago. And she's got a mat out on the tile floors. It's one of those slick tile floors, you know, where you step down on when you get out of the tub. So she gets in the tub, and she's washing. Is the baby being washed? Yes, the baby is inside the mother. You you can't. Whatever is happening to the mother happens to the baby. So 
So she turns off the shower. And she forgets that she pulled the mat up and put it in the laundry downstairs. Floor's wet, feet's wet, young 38-year-old lady, nine months pregnant. She steps out with one foot, other foot slips. Bam! Her head comes down on the side of the tub. And she's laying in the floor with a puddle of blood that's growing. Nobody comes to even look for her. Nobody, I mean, she doesn't know anybody, doesn't have any family. Two days go by. What happens to the mother? What happens to the baby? Because the baby is in the mother. You and I, the Bible say, were in Christ when he was here on earth. We were in Christ when he went to Calvary. We were physically inside of him somehow. And that's what Ellen White said, we're going to spend eternity studying this. But I'll send you the articles that make it really clear if you'll send me an email. Trust me, you will not regret the four articles. Three from Ellen White and one from W. Prescott from a message that she was there listening to him share. Eat, um, send me your, your uh, uh, mailing address. I'll print it and mail it to you. Or I'll give it to somebody and somebody. I'll send it to the pastor here and ask him to print them off. Um, if he's willing, which I'm sure he would. Um, I don't have the website up yet. It'll be two weeks. It'll be up. Anyway, but the point being is when Jesus died, we were in him and we died. When Jesus was raised, we were in him being raised to walk in newness of life. There's Bible for that. Romans 6, verse 1 through 10, and Galatians 2, 20. Those alone say that. Paul tells us that not only were we raised with him, but when he ascended on high, we ascended on high and are now seated in Christ Jesus in the heavens. That's the Bible. People can dance around it. You can jump around it. You can wrestle with it. It took me two years. But when God gave me these four articles, it was like it became so clear. I was like, God, thank you. Now, there's a reason why I'm taking time to share that with you. Through the Word of God, man is privileged to connect with Christ. We have got to see these statements as literal, not just as foggy theological terms. Ellen White had a third grade education. She was inspired by God to write this. Man is privileged to connect with Christ. And then, say that with me, the divine and the human combine. That's literal. And in this union, the hope of man must rest alone. That's that's breathtaking. Let's see if we can get that to cooperate now. Hopefully the batteries are not going. No, I don't have that in. I'll be so glad we don't have to worry about technology. Yoga, pantheism, and the poison of serpents. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I fear lest by any means, just as the serpent beguiled, that means mesmerized or hypnotized Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. I read that verse probably 200 times, and I was like, what does that mean, the simplicity? It's simple, the gospel's simple. Then how come more people aren't accepting it and being set free? And the Lord told me, Eric, you don't know what the word simplicity means. Look it up. I looked it up in Strong's Concordance, and this is the definition from the root and the original. It means singleness, union, folded together as one and clear. Do you remember Adam and Eve? They were clothed with robes of light because God was inside of them. Well, if this flesh is not clear, then how does that light get out? That's why Ellen White says there were times where Christ's divinity flashed through his humanity. Do you know what's interesting? I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but if you take metal and you fold it and heat it and fold it and heat it, it purifies it. The purer the metal becomes, no matter what metal it is, it will get to a point where it will become transparent. NASA actually coated the space shuttle's windshield with transparent gold. They had to, to protect from the radiation, but it was transparent. 
Are we not gold tried in the fire? To make us single in Christ, in union with Christ, folded together as one in Christ, and transparent, clear, so that the glory of God can shine through us. That's the the Greek word in Strong's Concordance. So if you're looking it up in a Strong's actual physical book, or if you have eSword on a computer, it's, it's easy. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. The foundation of his work was laid by the assurance he gave to Eve in Eden. You shall not surely die, for in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be enlightened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. I always read that, and I was like, it means, you know, you understand good and evil. That's not alone what it means. We are to know Christ. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Satan said, you don't have to just know God. You can know God and know me at the same time. That's called adultery if you're knowing two women at once, right? But yet that's common. Little by little, Satan has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. Paul tells us, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed as the son of perdition, destruction. The root word is apollia, which is the same as apollyon, the destroyer. And it's funny because Satan said that to the Pharisees. He says, you are of your father, the devil. I am of my father in heaven. Who, exal- who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, the heart of man, showing himself that he is God. I believe there will be a physical event. But I'm saying before we worry about the physical event, as Pastor Skeet said, we need to worry about the inward. The Apostle John says, Little children, let no man deceive you, for he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as Jesus is righteous. And if you know that Jesus is righteous, then you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is begotten of God. In this, the children, that means those begotten of God, are manifest, and the children of the devil. For whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Now, Nicodemus had problems with this because he was like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I know the health message, and I'm living by the dress reform, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. He had all his T's crossed and his I's dotted. And Jesus still looked at him and said, you have to be born again. You can't be born again by doing the works. You manifest that you have been begotten again because of the works of God in you. It's God that works in us, both to will and to do. Let no man deceive you by any means, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. You know, it's funny because the word Vatican... When you look it up, you can look it up anywhere. It literally means the divining serpent. That is the actual definition of the word. That's terrifying. The divining serpent. Divining means you're allowing something to speak through you. Yes, divination means you are, it's like a medium where she says, I'm going to channel a spirit and it speaks through the medium. I know. The days in which we live are eventful and full of peril. The signs of the coming of the end are thickening all around us. And events are to come to pass that will be of a more terrible character than any the world has yet witnessed. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. This is not, I'm not opening a can of worms, okay? But it's something we've got to study. 
We are to realize that the judgments of God are about to fall upon the earth. And this is in context. When I put dot, dot, dots, it doesn't mean there was a huge paragraph between. It means I'm giving you time to think about what was just said. It helps me when I'm reading. The judgments of God are about to fall upon the earth. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded Vile after vile poured out, one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. That's her words in context. Judgments of God are about to fall. Solemn events are yet to transpire. The very next thing she says is trumpets are going to sound. We had a pioneer, Uriah Smith. He wrote a book called Daniel and the Revelation. I didn't meet Uriah Smith. I have no doubt he was a man of God. But he was incorrect according to my, what I have found in Ellen White's writings and the Bible. He was incorrect on the trumpets. And the reason why is because he put the trumpets so far in the past. And the reason he did that, I would have done the same thing. He was living in a time with Ellen White and the other pioneers. And they were like, a Sunday law is being brought before Congress, the Blair Bill. Righteousness by faith just happened in Minneapolis. And we just saw a great earthquake and we saw the sun turn to darkness and the moon to blood. Stars have fallen. If all this is here, probation's about to close. Did they believe that? Were they correct? I, I hate to say it, but they weren't. Do you know what Paul wrote in the Bible? And this, guys, I'm not throwing you off. Paul wrote in the Bible... The time is at hand when those that be married will be as if they had no wife. That was 2,000 years ago. Was Paul misleading people? No. God has allowed every generation to be able to see the events as he wanted them to see it. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever read the statement where Sister White said, God's hand was covering the mistake we had made in the time? Have you ever read that? All right, wait a minute. So it wasn't really going to happen at the exact time they thought it was. And she says God was covering because it wasn't time yet. Did God know that they were not going to go into the heavenly Canaan in 1844? Yes, he knew. Did he know that Moses and Israel were not going to cross the Jordan the first time? Yes, he knew. Was it his will for them to go forward? Yes, it was. But he knew they would not do it. Guys, what happened in 1844 and 1888 did not take God by surprise. And for me as a Seventh-day Adventist, that really threw a kink in the rope for me. And then the Lord, I begged him. I was like, God, I need help to understand this. Why did you allow these things to happen? Peter and Paul and the other disciples thought you were coming in his day. Our pioneers thought it was happening in their day. And now we are there at the very end. How do we reconcile this? And the Lord said... What if I had just given the messages from 1844 through 1888? What if I just started giving those now? What if for the first time in human history, God was doing what he had done then, now? We'd have no books to share. We'd have no videos to share. We'd have no church to proclaim. God was like, that was a trial run to get you all ready. And so that you could see the mistakes that were made there, just like Israel. All these things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. God was like, that was the same thing. I wanted them to go. I had everything ready, but I knew they wouldn't. Because I wanted you to be there. Your names are written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. God was like, I have to wait on you and you and you. In the Old Testament, the greatest day of all the, the holy days, because uh, atonement was not a feast, you didn't eat. But the holy days, the greatest one was Day of Atonement. What came right before atonement? Trumpets. Day of Atonement was on the tenth day of the seventh month. Trumpets was the first day of the seventh month. Do you know what the trumpets were there for? To warn the people to get ready that Day of Atonement was about to come. And every case would be decided. We should understand that as Adventists. The Day of Atonement was a picture of the close of probation. The trumpets come to warn the world that the close of God's probation is about to happen. Because God doesn't want anyone to be lost. Unfortunately, most won't accept. 
But God actually says that. When you read in Revelation the trumpets, it says, and men repented not, and men repented not. When you get to the, the vials being poured out, it doesn't make any mention of men repenting not, because you can't. It's too late. Everything in our world is in agitation. Coming events cast their shadows before us. Rapidly men are ranging themselves under the banner they have chosen. They look for a God in humanity, and Satan personifies the one they seek. When Jesus came to the earth the first time, did he come in power or did he come in human flesh? Huh? Do you know I found, I think, two statements from Ellen White where she said Satan will appear first in human flesh before he manifests his angelic glory? I believe, I could be wrong. Okay, guys, I'm just like you. I could be wrong, but I believe that we're seeing Satan manifest in human flesh now through the man that's running the Vatican. Because the testimony of his sister and the other bishops, they said... Before he was elected to be the Pope, they said when the election was announced, they said he went into a room in the Vatican and locked the door. And he was in there for a certain period of time. And when he came out, it was a different human being. His sister said, this is not my brother. She said, it is, but it's not. I do not know who this man is. She said, my brother was never charismatic, hugging people, kissing, liking rock and roll and soccer. He's, he's doing that. She said, my brother's never been that. And it changed instantly. He went into that room, and when he came out, he was a different human being. You can, yeah. They look for a God in humanity. Multitudes will be so deluded through the rejection of the truth. Mark that, the truth, that they will accept the counterfeit. Humanity is hailed as God. Now I want to show you what truth is. I used to think truth is correct doctrine. And I'm not saying it's not, but there's more there. Jesus gave the definition of truth in John 17. He said, Father, sanctify them. Make them holy through thy truth. Yea, thy word is truth. You look up the word truth in Greek and you know what it is? Unfailing verity. Make them holy through your truth. Well, wait a minute, your word is truth. Make them holy through your word. Jesus said that. Be ye holy as I am holy. He wasn't telling you to do something. He was speaking an event into your life. And I'm, I'm going to take time. I'm not going to worry about it. I have to because this. if it's not real, you won't be able to grasp it. I can remember when my little boy was five years old. I mean, you all remember if you had a son or, or a little girl when they're five, I want to be just like daddy, you know? And I'm outside one day, and I've got a wheelbarrow, and I've got a pallet full of concrete sacks. They're 50 pounds per sack. Have you all ever moved concrete? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, I've got a pallet of it. It has to be taken all the way to the other side of the backyard. So I've got the wheelbarrow, and I'm going to load you know, a couple in there. And my son comes out, and he's like, Dad, can I help? And I was like, yeah, I mean, this is good, you know, to get your boy in there and, you know, teach him how to be a man. So I was like, okay, Connor, what you have to do, I'm going to show you, watch. People say Christ is our example, but they stop there. If he's just an example, you're lost because you can never do what he did on your own. My little boy wants to do what daddy's doing. I pick up that 50-pound pack of sack concrete, and I put it in the wheelbarrow, I grab the handles of the wheelbarrow, and I lift it up, and I take it to the other side, set it down, stack the concrete, and I bring it back. I said, you see what I did, son? That's an example. Did you see me? Yes, daddy. Okay, you got 49 left to go. I'll come back in two hours and check on you. Yes, daddy. And he's fired up. And I go inside, and I'm doing some other work, and I think, you know, I wonder how he's doing. And I walk out to the door, and I look out, and you know what I see? There's a little five-year-old boy sitting out there with his hands like this and crying. There's two bags of concrete that are broken open all over the ground. The wheelbarrow's half on its side. He wants to do what's right. It's impossible for a five-year-old boy to pick up 50-pound bags of concrete, much less the wheelbarrow. If Christ is only example, we're lost. Ellen White says the same thing. She said, Christ 
won our battles for us if we will appropriate his word as ours. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Be ye holy. Let there be light, and there was. Lord, I know if thou wilt, you can make me clean. I will be thou clean. Boom, he was clean. And people say, yeah, but sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And I, I struggled with that. I was like, God, your servant said that. Maybe she was mistaken. I mean, you know, I don't know. She's not equal to the Bible. I love Ellen White. And if you ever see my message, I quote her extensively. But you, she said, this is the only infallible source. Do you understand? I'm not being liberal and I'm not throwing Ellen White out. But guys, we've got to hold fast. Pastor Stephen Bohr said the same thing. This is, that is the infallible word of God. So here we are trying to do what's right, and yet we can't on our own. We can't on our own. We have to appropriate what Christ did as ours. We have to say, he's spoken it, I believe it, so I'm going to walk. When he told Peter, Peter's in the ship, you remember the storm came? And he was like, Master, if it's you, tell me to walk out on the water. Jesus said, come. Peter, I think, wow, he stepped out of the boat onto a lake that was at least 100 or 200 feet deep. It wasn't like a shallow little you know, pond. And he walked. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, he looked, and he got afraid, and he started sinking. And you know what Jesus said to him? When you look it up in Greek, it actually says, at what point did you stop believing? One has come from the heavenly courts to represent God in human form. That's what Adam was here for, to show us what it looks like for God to dwell in a man. When he sinned, it was lost. You guys still awake? If you need to stand up, you're not going to bother me. Stand up. If you want to stand up and just walk for a minute, you're okay as long as you don't get rowdy or roll around in the floor. One has come from the heavenly courts to represent God in human form. The Son of God was made man and dwelt among us. In him was life, and the life was the light to man. Christ came to show us, guys, God was trying to show us for 4,000 years through the, the written word, and we didn't get it. We were blind. He was like, I'm just going to send my son and show them what it looks like to be a son and daughter of God. And Nicodemus said that. We know at the Sanhedrin, we know that you came from God because no man can do the works that you're doing except God be with him. You look the word with up, it's really in, except God be in him. The light shined in the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. Desire of Ages, page 161. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being, from the bright and holy angels to man, should be a temple for the indwelling of the Creator. But because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple for God. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the divine one. John chapter 2. Jesus went into the temple and he started casting out the buyers and sellers. And they said, what are you doing? They actually asked him a question. They said, who gives you the right to do this? Do you want to know why? Because Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9 talk about what Jesus was doing. Daniel 9.24 specifically. They knew the prophecy in the Old Testament said that this is what the Messiah is going to do, cleanse his temple. It says that. They knew. When they saw Jesus go in there and start throwing out the pigs, the doves, and, and more of the people and the money, they were like, wait a minute, this is what Daniel said. Do you know that today, if you are a Jewish person, traditional Judaism, there's two chapters of the Bible that you are forbidden by the rabbis to read. Isaiah 53 and Daniel chapter 9. 
Those are the ones that identify Christ. They knew who he was saying he was. And Jesus answered them and said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But this he spake of the temple of his body. And Paul tells us which body we are. Ellen White says in this same chapter, she says, When Christ was cleansing the sanctuary, he was showing that his mission here was to cleanse our hearts. This is a Shaolin monk, Xing Yang Ming. He fled from China, quote unquote, um, for asylum here in the U.S. And he opened up a Shaolin temple in New York City. I've never been there. My wife has been to just visit it when she was there. Um, I'm just going to go through here. He, he says something at the bottom. He says, the Shaolin monk's teaching method is said to be unique. Among his students, there are Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, etc., Shi Yong Ming wants newcomers to observe a class before they sign up. He also wants them to understand Chan or Zen philosophy first, even the children's students. So you sign up, and he's like, the first thing your, your studies are going to be on is Chan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism. But he's got students that are Christian and Muslim and Hindu and Shi Yong Ming says that Chan or Zen philosophy is simple. That is, heart to heart and mind to mind. He says he never tries to change others' beliefs. Well, you're teaching them Zen Buddhism. Shi Yong Ming wants everybody to have an open heart. That means open mind. You're not supposed to have an open mind. Your mind is supposed to be guarded by the Word of God. He says he wants everyone to have an open heart and to respect their own body as a temple. That's a Buddhist. Okay, what is going to dwell in that temple? Look what's on the wall behind him, the dragon. And we just read Ellen White said they will become the habitation of dragons. Shi Yong Ming says, let go of ego, maintain perspective, and let your mind be free and flexible. Ego does not mean pride here. It's talking about your ID, who you identify yourself as. That's part of the Zen philosophy. This is what the word Zen or Chan Buddhism means. It is a religious sect derived from the Hindu word dhyana. Dhyana is a meaning, it means a process of meditation that is used to achieve an awakening to the Buddha nature. You read in women's magazines about Zen and health and fitness and about Zen. That's what Zen is for. That's from Encyclopedia Britannica. It is to awaken you or enlighten you to the Buddha nature. Do you know what the nature of God, how that's achieved? Is if God lives in you. You know how the Buddha nature is achieved? If you allow the God of Buddhism or Hinduism to live in you. Like Adam and Eve who ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Many, even within our own churches, are now feeding upon the deceptive morsels of error. Satanic agencies are clothing false theories, science, so-called, in an attractive garb. These agencies are instilling into human minds that which in reality is deadly error. The hypnotic influence of Satan will rest upon those who turn from the plain word of God to pleasing fables. Ella White actually says something that shocked me. She said that Satan hypnotized Adam and Eve. And I was like, I mean, it wasn't like he dangled a watch. He spoke to them. Do you know what that's called? Neuro-linguistic programming. NLP. I remember years ago hearing about NLP coming into churches, and I was like, you know, what in the world is wrong with those you know, people in the Adventist church? They should know better. Do you know that NLP is taught in almost every college in the United States? It's being taught to business professionals so they can know how to control their workforce. You use language. You talk to them. That's why Ellen White said that when Christ came here, God told him, do not enter into conversation or debate with Satan. Programming, NLP. 
Christ knew because of his human nature, I cannot even allow myself to start discussing things because Satan will twist the words. The most sorrowful thought of all is that under this deceptive influence, men will have a form of godliness without having a real connection with God. This is a Time magazine from a number of years ago. The lady is doing yoga. And you see what Ellen White was talking about, so-called science. The science of yoga. Millions of Americans are discovering this ancient exercise. Here's the skinny on why it makes you feel so good. It does. People tell me, they'll call and they'll say, yeah, but it works. Acupuncture, is that wrong? I'm like, yes, it's of the devil. And they're like, how? And I'm like, and I go through a whole list and tell them how. And they're like, yeah, but it works. It can't be wrong. And I'm like, just because it works does not mean it's of God. The devil has power. According to a recent USA Today study, yoga has grown in this country, or I'm sorry, to a $27 billion industry worldwide with an estimated 20 million active practitioners in the United States alone. 20 million. And you know what they're doing now? They're doing yoga for pregnant mothers, and they're doing baby yoga. That's terrifying. Christian yoga. If you go on Little Light Studios' YouTube site, they just did a two-part um, series on Christian yoga. It's worth watching. It's worth watching. I, I got to help a little bit with that. But um, this says yoga for Christians, a Christ-centered approach to physical and spiritual health through yoga. This is some common things that you all are familiar with. Over on the far left, you see a book. It's called Baby Om. Have you ever heard people do that when they're chanting? They go, oh, you know what I'm talking about? You know, that phrase is a mantra that invokes a spirit, a mantra. That's what the, I've heard Adventist pastors say that. Oh, that's my mantra. A mantra is a Hindu word. It's a word that is repeated over and over again in order to invoke one of their gods. It's not just a, a phrase. Amen. The word om, that sound that they make, it is specifically to channel the sun god. They tell you that. How about yogi tea? Has anybody here ever seen that in the grocery store? Okay, on the east coast, she has. On the east coast, I can go into Kroger's or Ingalls or any grocery store and you can find yogi teas. Recently, apparently they've caught a lot of attention as to the paganness of their, their company. So they repackage their, their packaging now. They have not done it as obvious as this. But if you look on the side of any yoga tea box, there'll be instructions on how to do Hinduism. And that's frightening. One of the teas they used to have, it was called something dragon tamer or something. And it had a woman on the back of a dragon holding a golden cup in her hand. My little girl was like 12 years old and we were walking down the aisle and she stopped and she looked. And she grabbed it. She said, Daddy, that's in Revelation. <laughs> and I looked and I thought, man, the devil is just putting it right in your face. And then you have this lady doing some yoga, and there's the Buddha behind her. Just in case you didn't know, the Buddha was Hindu. Bodhidharma that brought Hinduism from India, and he tried to correct some of the mistakes that were being made in China. He was the one that brought everything to the Shaolin Temple. It's Hinduism. All of that came from India into China, and from China it spread through the world. That little figure on the teacup in the middle, that's Ganesh. He's a Hindu god. He's part man and part elephant. Yeah. So here's pictures of this. You've got this monkey god over to the left, and then you've got Ganesh there in the middle, and then you have the men that they call the god men in India. Here in America and in Europe, we make yoga look like it's the greatest thing in the world. And I don't encourage you to look for photographs because almost any time you search for any of the information on yoga, Hinduism is a sensual religion. It's, it's sexual. Everything in Hinduism focuses on the flesh. Chinese, they, they hide it better. It's not there. 
Even though it was the same, they, they, they changed things differently. But when you look in America, if you're looking for pictures of yoga, you're going to see almost everybody's naked. I mean, like, or they should be. I mean, you know what I'm saying? They're wearing as little as humanly possible. And I'm like, wait a minute, why do you have to not wear any clothes to do yoga? And they're like, well, you've got to be flexible. And I'm like, I can wear sweatpants and be flexible. They can be baggy. It's almost like the superheroes. Why do they all have spray-painted clothes on? What is the purpose of that? Guys, they knew what they were doing. If you take a woman's body and spray paint it, you can see every curve. If you take a man and he's you know, strong and, and you spray paint him with no clothes on, you can see every muscle. It's there for one purpose. But this is what the men look like when they become divine, connected to Brahma. If that's, if that's the end result of that religion, why would anyone want to be any part of it? And these were some of the more decent-looking ones. Now listen to this. This is from a yoga website, Anata Sangha Worldwide. They said, etymologically, the word yoga is connected to the English word yoke. Yoga means union with Brahma or union of the little ego self with the divine self, the infinite spirit. Yoga is primarily a spiritual discipline. I get people that they'll write to me and they're like, it's Christian. I'm just doing it for exercise. I'm just doing it for exercise. If you have a chance, there's a video available online. It was done a few years ago by a lady I knew named Carol Matriciana. She was raised in India. She was part of this for over 20 years. She's British, I think. Her, her dad was part of the parliament over there. But she went back after she became a Christian, and she interviewed yoga teachers here, Christian yoga teachers here, and then she went back to India, and she interviewed Hindu gurus and former Hindus that were teachers that were now Christian. And you hear them tell you where this power comes from. And they all say the same thing. You cannot separate the physical exercise from the Hindu religion. This one terrified me. Christ Toga. I know these ladies have been deceived, but they have put together this thing that they called Christ Toga, Christian Yoga. And I'm going to, some of these we've covered. How about this? Has anybody ever heard of this movie before? Avatar. Do you know what's interesting about that word? It's also all over social media. Have you ever opened up an account like on a Facebook or whatever and it said, what's your avatar? Look for that word because the avatar is the thing that represents you. So you can put a picture in there or some kind of an icon or whatever, but that represents you. It stands as your substitute, your representative. When this movie came out, it was one of the most widely watched and most elaborate money-making films that had ever been done. But very few people realized what the word means or where it came from. How about, um, how about the, the first in the new Star Wars series? There was a queen. Her name was Padme. Did anybody ever see that? Okay. Padme is a Hindu word. It's the name of a Hindu god. It's all through Hollywood. They're doing that to get us used to this. Let me show you something. It's interesting here that you've got an alien on one side and you've got a human on the other, but they've become one. Aliens exist. They're called fallen angels that are impersonating. They are. Now listen to this. This article was released one month after the movie Avatar, the first one, was released in the theater. One month, 30 days. I'm going to just highlight it. They said that they began receiving reports from people that had went and watched the movie, and they said after leaving the movie, for months, they were experiencing depression, suicidal thoughts, um, very, very negative. And they had to actually open up another website just to handle the problem. And you think, okay, why were they having suicidal thoughts? Well, the movie was about men and aliens becoming one. The mind of the man was put into the alien's body, and that's just the opposite of what the devil's doing. He wants his mind to be in us instead of the mind of Christ. 
This is what the word avatar means. In Hindu, it means those that fell or descended from the heavens. That's literally, I went to a Hindu website and that's what it means. Those that came down or fell or descended from the heavens. It's also defined as the descent, the appearing, the manifestation or incarnation of a Hindu god, such as Vishnu, Krishna, or Shiva to the earth. In addition, Hinduism will often confer the title of avatar to extraordinary individuals who have experienced self-realization and union with the universal energy. That's pantheism. This universal energy is what they say is it's inside you and it's inside the piano and it's inside the tree. And when I was in Chinese Qigong, we used to do that. You know, our, our master would tell us after we got to a certain point, he was like, do you need more chi energy? You know, go out, find a good tree, a strong tree, not one that has disease. And we would get in a certain pose and you'd stand there and you would take your hands and you would absorb this, quote, universal energy they call chi from the tree. And then you'd walk away after an hour of doing that. And then you felt like, wow. Well, it was all because you believed it. Because you obeyed what the devil said to do, the spirit was given power to come into you. That's why God says, obey me. Because when you obey me, his spirit comes into you through his word and does what his word has promised. This is another man, I believe he's in Europe. Um, yeah, there were some of his photographs I couldn't even put up. He's covered in tattoos. There's a reason why the Bible told us not to do that. Um, it opens the door for evil spirits. If you have had a, ta a tattoo put on, it's expensive to get removed. But you can ask the Lord, Lord, I did this in ignorance. I'm claiming your shed, son's shed blood. Bind and cast out of me anything that had access to my life through that. The forces of darkness will unite with human agents who have given themselves into the control of Satan. And the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. Through yielding to satanic influences, men will become transformed into fiends. Now, you see what that avatar looked like? It's blue, right? In all of James Cameron's movies, the avatars are blue. He's getting ready to come out with a second one sometime soon. Now, let me show you what a Hindu avatar really looks like. This is one over on the left. Do you see what's wrapped around his neck? A cobra. That's what Satan always says. He's like, look, I'll be your friend. I'll go around your neck. Why would he want to go around the neck? The Holy Spirit is likened by the Bible to breath, to wind. That serpent around the neck is to allow the head knowledge to stay, but it not to reach the heart. And that's why Christ says in Proverbs, my son, my daughter, give me your heart. Your head is fine. I mean, I can fix that. I can give you correct information. But if I don't have your affections, it's waste of time. No woman wants a man to be married with her with his head. She wants his heart. No man wants a woman who's just with him that's the right thing to do. I'm just going to do this. He's got money. He'll take care of it. No, you want her heart. That's what God wants from us. Now, if you look at the one over here to the right, this one scared me. This, this is probably hundreds of years old. I don't know when they, the original painting was done. This is a Hindu avatar. You see, she's got the mermaid, you know, half animal, half man, which that's interesting. All those other gods were half man and half animal. But she holds a sign up in her right hand. It's a hexagram, a six-pointed star. And I don't want to offend anybody, but the hexagram was never used in Israel as a good thing. Many people say it's the star of David. David never touched that thing. The hexagram was always used. The only time the Bible even mentions a star being used by Israel was when they worshiped the pagan god Moloch. They held his star as a symbol. The nation of Israel now, the reason they have that on their flag is because that six-pointed star was the Rothschild's family shield, and they were the ones that bought the land back so that Israel would be there. Not saying Israel is not of God, but I'm saying God's still trying to save them. Amen.
But she's holding that symbol up. And what that symbol has is it has a triangle pointing down and a triangle pointing up that have joined in union. That's the same thing as a yin and yang. It's light and darkness blended, but it goes deeper. Now, I'm going to point something else out that really struck me about this picture. She's holding four children in her arms, and she's holding them to her chest. That means she's feeding them. Do you understand? Okay, they're nourished off of her. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious. And that's the colors that are there. Satan is doing, and I'm not saying that song is bad. I'm saying that's what Satan is doing to deceive people. I mean, honestly, don't, don't get upset about the song. Pope Benedict, look at his tiara, the same six-pointed star. There's a reason why the Catholic Church is called the Catholic Church. Catholic means universal. They have to bring Hinduism and Buddhism into the fold or else they can't make the whole world one. It's easier to get Christians because we already believe in Jesus. You can modify things a little bit, but what do you do with the Hindus and the Buddhists? And they are the largest majority of the world's population. You have to use spiritualism. Here's the same six-pointed star in the symbol for theosophy, Madame H.P. Blavowski. Well, that's, and that's not even a Nazi symbol. Hitler got that symbol of the swastika. He got it from Hinduism. The swastika is actually the same symbol as the six-pointed star. It represents the joining or union of light and darkness or of flesh and spirit. And it's funny, yeah, the serpent swallowing its tail is called the Ouroboros. The reason it's swallowing its tail is because God says that if we want eternal life, we eat of his word. Hinduism and Buddhism says eternal life is inside you. You, you find eternal life through self, not through another. This is what one of the Hindu, a very popular Hindu swami said. I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name. Each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity within by controlling nature, external and internal. Do this either by work or worship or by psychic control or philosophy. Ellen White said the path of truth and error lies so close that they're hardly distinguishable until you see the end. You understand? If I take a line and I draw it here and I draw another line that's just a quarter of an inch off, you won't even be able to notice the difference until they're out about 20 feet and then you'll see they're in opposite directions. Do you understand? He says, do this by one or more of all of these and be free. This is the whole of religion. Here's some of the original. The original yin and yang was the Ouroboros. And then the Chinese said, we've got to adapt that. The Taoists said, it really needs to have a circle in the center of it, which is also a symbol of the sun god. But the circle and the symbol of the dot in the center is male and female in union. That's why the Washington obelisk, you know, the monument, it's got a circle at the base and there's all of the obelisk worldwide, which are pagan symbols. That's what they represent, that god. Then you see the swastika, and here is a Buddhist idol that's probably a thousand years old. And look at the look at the swastika on his chest. This is what they tell us that yin and yang means: negative and positive, female and male, day and night, active and passive, the sun, the moon, logical versus intuitive, hot versus cold, hard versus soft. That's how they tell the beginners. They don't want you to be afraid. And you go, oh, that makes sense. But you know, I read something years ago in the Bible that really helped me. The Bible says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. They say the yin and yang is a picture of what God is, a blending of light and darkness. They also say that the yin, the dark side, is feminine, and the male is the light side, masculine. 
that also represents flesh as the female and spirit as the male. The entire purpose of that is the union of flesh and spirit, but not the spirit of God, the spirit of evil spirits, the spirit of Satan. Here's the same symbol used today. They are working hard to get people to be used to seeing this. General Albert Pike, he was a Civil War general, and he's the one that wrote the Masonic Bible. It was called Morals and Dogma. Listen to what he said, and this is the same philosophy. He said, yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai, or the Lord Jesus, is also God. And he's lying. He doesn't, he's lying. He says, for the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, and there can be no white without black. For the absolute, which is what he calls God, can only exist as two gods, darkness being necessary to light. Do you know something that's interesting? Years ago, there was um, a young man in a classroom, and some people have said that it's Albert Einstein. We don't know that for sure. But he stood up and he opposed this, this teaching. And he said something. He said, that's not correct. There is no such thing as darkness. Darkness is only the absence of light. And the professor looked at him and said, what about hot and cold? He said, there is no such thing as cold. It's just the absence of heat. And the professor said, how can you prove that? And this young man said, because you cannot find the limit to how hot you can make something, but we know the exact number that you can't make it any colder. And you can look that up. I think it's 364 degrees or 360 degrees negative. I don't remember. Absolute zero. What, is it 364 or 360? Okay, somewhere in there. But you can't go any colder. It's impossible to go any colder because to have a dark room, how do you bring darkness into a room? You have to take out all the light, and darkness is the result. That was powerful. Within, and this is from another one of those same Swami gurus, Hindu gurus. He said, within every human being lies a divine cosmic energy called kundalini. That's not true. Kundalini is a serpent. And they say that within everybody, that serpent is already there. Almost every tradition speaks of it in one form or another and describes kundalini in its own way. In Japanese, it is called ki. If you practice Aikido, that's what Aikido is all about. I made a black belt in Aikido, studied it for years and years. Aikido is the way of harmonizing with that energy they call qi. In Chinese, it's called qi. What is kundalini? It is the power of the self. Isn't that funny? The one thing that God says we have to be freed from is the one thing that martial arts and yoga and Tai Chi build. I need to die. And they're like, no, 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 no. You're already a god. You just haven't realized it yet. Kundalini is Shakti, which is one of the Hindu gods. Supreme energy whom the sages of India worship as the mother of the universe. You see how they have that illustrated. It's light and darkness as one. This is a woman who is a Kundalini instructor. She said, um, actually, the quote above that is another one. It says, The divine power of kundalini shines like the stem of a young lotus. Like a snake coiled around upon herself, she holds her tail in her mouth and lies resting half asleep at the base of the body. Um, it's at the tailbone. And some people will call it the perineum. It's a point between the genitals and the tailbone. Um, it, there's, yeah. We don't need to get into details. There's a very soft point in the body that lies between the reproductive organs and the tailbone. They say that's where this serpent is. And the whole goal of kundalini is to get that serpent to travel up the spine until it sits here. When it sits here, they say that the third eye is open and you begin to have extrasensory perception. And that's what everybody in yoga wants. They say, no, it's just for stretching. That's to get you down the, you know, down the path a little bit. Once you've been in there for a few years, you start seeing 
I want more. I want there's something else there that I'm not getting yet. Kundalini is called the coiled and dormant feminine energy. It is the vast potential of psychic energy contained within all of us. That's what she says. She's wrong. It's normally symbolized as a serpent coiled into three and a half circles. Isn't that funny? Time, time, and half a time. Spiraling around the central axis or the sacral bone at the base of the spine. The awakening of this serpent and the manifestation of its powers is a primary aim of the practice of yoga. They don't tell you that when you walk in the door. Only when kundalini is awakened, it is only when kundalini is awakened that we become aware of our true nature of our greatness, of the fact that not only do we belong to God, but we are God. Do you see how deceptive? God wants us to know that we are sons and daughters of God. But do you know how he told us to do that? Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, counted it not robbery to be like unto God, but made himself of no reputation. God dwells within the humble and the contrite, not within those that say, I'm there. Yes, sir. It's called the lotus position. Um, it opens up the joints of the body, especially the hips. Um, to sit in it is uncomfortable if you've never done it, but you have to. You do it in karate, you do it in kung fu, you do it in tai chi, you do it in yoga. You cross your legs and you have to bring the ankles up to where they're resting on top of the, the thigh where the knee meets. It, it hurts, but it's to stretch the joints. And I used to wonder, why is yoga focused on you being so flexible? And why is Tai Chi focused on being so flexible? And why is Kung Fu and Aikido and Karate, why is flexibility such an issue? And the Lord showed me one day. He said, Eric, I saw a picture of a puppet. If I'm a puppet for a little boy and none of the joints move, I'm not much fun to play with. But if you've got a puppet that's limber, your strings can be pulled very easily. Do you understand? If you're flexible, it's easy for a spirit that possesses you to control your movements. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to be honest. I'm still studying Pilates. The instructor in Pilates had a background in martial arts, and he also had a background with some yoga practice. I don't know how much of that fell into Pilates. I will tell you this, though, and this is something to be careful. If someone was to go to a Pilates class, right now probably 60 or 70% of the Pilates classes are held by schools that also teach yoga. So if the teacher is teaching Pilates and they also do yoga, you're automatically getting that thread woven into your teaching. When, I t when you're doing martial arts, martial arts is a way of life. When I did Kung Fu, and I don't say this to brag, okay, I'm so thankful that I don't have any of that ability anymore. But I made a black belt, at least a first-degree black belt, in seven different styles. I, I knew martial arts. Anything that I did, my philosophy that I had learned through those arts was woven into it even when I went to church on Sabbath. You can't separate that thread that's been taught to you. So if you were to go and find a Pilates class, find somebody that only does Pilates, that has no affiliation with the other. You know, I'm still doing research, but, you know, we'll let you know if I find anything out. Yes, ma'am. change of heart and she said um, she had demon possessed. She, she wow. became de demon possessed but she didn't actually know but she said she got, uh, she asked me is this, is this real? Like I'm hearing um, somebody talking to me next to my pillow yeah. and to the point she had to go to her mom next, she's 29 years old she was so scared 
Um, so it's real. Yes, ma'am. Now we're coming to the close. Today there are coming into educational institutions and into, into churches everywhere spiritualistic teachings that undermine faith in God and His Word. The theory that God is an essence pervading all nature is received by many who profess to believe the Scriptures. But however beautifully clothed, this theory is a most dangerous deception. It misrepresents God and is a dishonor to His greatness and majesty. It surely tends not only to mislead, but to debase men. That means to take you back to the carnal. Darkness is its element and sensuality is its sphere. The result of accepting this theory is separation from God. This is a quote from Osensei, Moria Ueshiba. He was the founder of Aikido. I have seen film footage of this man when he was over 80 years old, and he would have... I'll, I'll tell you, is it okay if I take a, a, a few minutes to share something? I know it's late. We've been here for the whole weekend, but, I, you know, if you need to go, you go home. I won't be mad, honestly. I won't have my feelings hurt. When he was getting older, over 80, they knew we're not going to have him around for, for long, forever. And the Japanese government had a lot of high-level officials that were part of the new generation of Japan. They had done away with the feudal Japan. Japan was trying to become part of the modern world. And the leaders in Japan said, we need to take hold of the modern, but we don't want these leaders to forget our history. So they asked Moria Ueshiba if he would be willing to come and talk to the leaders because he was like the last of the, the samurai class. Not that he was a samurai, but the, that training he said yes. So he brought a number of his black belts with him. There were hundreds of officials that were there. And they're all, all these men are high up officials within Japan. They're all dressed in their black suits, white shirts, black ties, and they're waiting to hear what this man will say. All of a sudden, I don't remember, 20, 18, 20 black belts come in. And I'm not talking, guys, here in the United States, most martial arts schools, you see, it's point sparring. I mean, do you understand? It's points. It means. I got gotcha. you. I touched you. I got a point. If I get three points, I win. That's not martial arts, okay? I'm not saying it's okay to do it, but it, it's, it's, not more, it's not fighting. They didn't do that there. The school I went, we didn't do that. They sent these black belts in, and these black belts were black belts. I mean, they knew how to fight on the street. These, all these 18, 20 black belts come in there and then come in a couple of men carrying, carrying Moria Ueshiba on a cot because he's old. He's over 80. And he's kneeling on his knees and he's sitting very still. And they bring him in on a cot and they set him down in the middle of this circle of black belts. Now, I have to tell you something. I've had people tell me, well, the black belts weren't really trying to get him. If you're training under a master or a grandmaster and he says, I want you to hit me, and you hold back, you, you can forget about rank. You might even be demoted. If you hold back when he tells you, I want you to hit me like you mean it, and you don't, that means you don't believe he can take it. And he, you, will, you can cancel any chance of making rank for a couple of years, or you may even be demoted. No black belt will hold back. So he sits there, and then he nods. One man comes out and attacks, and he redirects him and throws him. Another man comes out and attacks. Pretty soon, there's three and four at one time, and he's circling and grabbing their hands and throwing them, and, and they've learned how to roll so it doesn't bam and hit the floor, but he's still throwing them around like rag dogs or rag dolls. Pretty soon, after a few minutes, he's throwing. Then people start coming out with bokens, wooden swords. They're hard. Most of them are made out of oak. They're swinging to hit him, and he'll just move just a, a, a hair out of the way, grab their hand, redirect them, throw them, and he takes their sword and throw it off to the side. Then 10 of them attack him at one time. None of them were able to put a hand on him. Next thing you know, he's standing on his feet, and he's moving as if he was floating. He was really on the ground. 
but I'm saying his movements were so graceful, it looked like he was floating. And he threw every one of them to the ground. Not one person in all of them were able to lay hands on him. And then he went back over to the side, and they were all laying on the ground now because it had gotten rough. Some of them he even threw without having to touch them. A man came running at him from one side, and he took a step and put his hand up, and the man flipped completely backwards and hit the ground. And people say, that's not possible. That's Star Wars. It is possible. I've done it, and I've had it done to me. I remember the last, and I shouldn't say I've done it. I haven't. The demons that were in control of my life did it. The last grandmaster I trained under, the one I told you all about the other night that was a tenth dawn and two systems, I remember the very last time he came to my school. He used to be able to push me. We would do something called rooting. It's done in Qigong and in Tai Chi. You get in a certain stance and you, you focus your mind and you imagine you're growing roots down into the ground so that you can't be moved. And it, that's, you know, if somebody comes up and pushes on you, it's hard. You, you can't physically stop them from pushing you down. But you'd get to a point where it didn't matter if five people were in front of you, all of them pushing, you just stand there. Because the demons were holding you there. You couldn't be moved. Well, I would root like that, and he would stand 20 feet away from me, and he'd go, and he'd put his hand up, and I would feel, you know what it feels like when you take two magnets and try to push them together? I would feel it felt like a magnet would just go, boom, and I mean, they would just push me off my feet from 20 feet away, and I'm like, man, that's power. I mean, you know, who has to worry about fighting anymore if you just knock somebody down without even having to touch them? The last time he came to the school, I had given my life to Christ, and, and the Lord was still working to help me, to get me completely free. And I asked my students there, I said, I had a couple of them that I knew were strong Christians. I said, guys, I said, you all know where I'm at right now. I said, I'm trying to figure out what's spiritual and what's physical. I said, my grandmaster's coming up today. And if, at the level that I was at, if you're not doing energy, chi, there's no point in doing martial arts anymore. Everything is about chi. I hadn't told my grandmaster I wasn't doing chi anymore. I just kind of thought, oh, I'm just, just going to ride it as long as I can because maybe I can get the next level. Well, he came up that day and he said, what do you want me to teach? And I said, let's do ground fighting. You know, UFC, teach people how to do this stuff on the ground. And he looked at me like, are you serious? <laughs> and I said, yeah. I said, right now there's a lot of interest in that. I said, I think it'd be a good thing if we did that. So we spent the entire day just, he wore everybody out. They were exhausted. And then at the very end, he said, Eric, come up here for a minute. And I walked up, and he said, let me show you all how this is done. We've done this physical thing. Let me show you how it's really done. He said, Eric, I want you to grow roots. Root yourself. And I thought, oh, God, I didn't want this to happen. I told him I don't want anything with chi. And I, I stood there. I didn't even root myself. I just stood there because I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. Lord, I'm not doing that anymore. And that man put his hand up. And there was nothing. I didn't feel anything. And he looked at me, and it was kind of like, what just happened? And then he walked up closer, put his hand probably this far from me, and he projected that energy again. I didn't even feel anything. I was just standing there looking at him, and I was like, man, I don't want to embarrass him. You know, and God is like, I know God was laughing. And then finally he put his hand on me, and I still didn't feel anything. And then he, he engaged the body. It's like if I was pushing this and I'm back here and I'm going like that, then he did this. Mm. You see what I'm doing? He locked that joint and he turned with his joint locked and I moved. And he put his head down. And this man was in his 50s. He'd been training for over 40 years. He put his head down. He walked to the back of my school shaking his head. And I was like, thank you, God. Because I knew that day you can't do this. Listen to what Mori Ayueshiba said. The art of peace, Aikido, that I practice has room for each of the eight worlds, eight million gods, and I cooperate with them all. I had multiple books that were written by him that I took these quotes from. He says, the God of peace is very great and includes all that is divine and enlightened in every land. That sounds like the Pope. All the roads lead, you know, back to Rome. He says the divine is not something high above us. It is in heaven. 
It is in earth. It is inside us. Each and every master, regardless of the era or the place, heard the call and attained harmony or peace with heaven and earth. There are many paths leading to the top of Mount Fuji, but there is only one summit, love. I need to ask you all a question. I've got, I've got a video clip I would love to show you as part of the ending of this. Um, since we don't have HDMI down here, have, can I get a mic and maybe hold it up to my computer? Or is there a way to, to do that? Listen to what he says. The summit is love. Everyone has, and you can come help me if you don't mind. Everyone has a spirit that can be refined and a body that can be trained in some manner. A suitable path to follow. And then he says, you are here to realize your inner divinity and to manifest your innate enlightenment. It means it's already there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get you, um, if you can, just actually... You do, you, do you need the video up there? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, hold on. Hold on just one second. I know, I'm sorry. You guys forgive me. I can do this. Let me see here. It'll just take a second to find it. We may not be able to, because I do not see. If I show it right here on my computer, will it not show there? Okay, all right, give me a second. I think I know why we can do this. I should have thought about this earlier and I forgot. This is a video clip that... Um, is part of a National Geographic documentary that came out a year or two ago with uh, an actor, Morgan Freeman. Are you all familiar with him? Yes. Um, I want to encourage you as you watch this, remind your children here that what this man is saying is not of God. Okay? Um, well, I can put it on the thumb drive. That way he can have the video up there. Is that what he needs? Okay. Let me just stick that there, and then he can put it up there for the live stream. All right. Let's see here. Let me find it. Okay. Well, hold on. Here it is. That's it. Okay, we found it. Well, I can give it to you and you just give it to him. Okay. All right. This is in the same folder, the media files. And the name of the clip is called Pantheism, the God Within. Yes, we'll, we'll need to. Let me pause it here. All right, tell me when you're ready. Um, right here. Yes, sir. You can kind of play with it and you should be able to hear. <clears throat> Guys, you tell me when I can when I can run it down.
This is clearly faith in the God in you. Your inspiration. Your power. God is so many things to so many people. The warm light of the sun. The sound of sweet music. An inner voice that drives us forward. A friend. If you ask me who God is, I would say there's a bit of the divine in all of us. It's God in you. God in me. The God in me is who I really am at my core. The God in me is the best version of me. The God in me is who I strive to be, who I was meant to be. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Alá. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. Okay, let's bring the lights back up. That's terrifying. Yes. Morgan Freeman is an atheist, and yet he said, God, there's God in me. Doesn't even, doesn't even believe in Christianity, but yet he says there's a God that lives inside of him. So no matter what you believe, you've got God inside of you. And then you just heard what that other martial arts grandmaster said, it's all about love. And that's exactly what the Pope said. The Bible says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. He that saith he knoweth God and keepeth not his commandments is, is a liar and the truth is not in him. God doesn't say that in anger. We say it. You're a liar. I don't like that person. They're not keeping the commandments of God. Well, I'm going to share something with you. If you know 10 commandments and you're only keeping three of them in your heart, and another person only knows three of them, and they're keeping all three in their heart, who's keeping the commandments and who's not? To whom great is given, much is required. We can't look down on people, but yet at the same time, we have to know the deception that is being promoted right now. Okay, let's close. These theories follow to their logical conclusion, sweep away the entire Christian economy. That means the plan for man's salvation. They do away with the necessity for what? Is everybody awake? Stand up for a minute. Just stand up and take a deep breath. It'll feel good. It's easier for me because I'm up here walking around. If you want to stand for a few minutes, you're okay. These theories do away with the necessity of an atonement. Remember what the word atonement means? At one minute. Christ is the link that unites us back to God. 
He's the one that takes away our sins so that God can now come and live inside of us and empower us to do what's right. These theories regarding God make His word of no effect. And you can sit whenever you want to, or you can stand, it doesn't matter. Those who accept these theories are in great danger of being led to finally look upon the whole Bible as a fiction. They may regard virtue as better than vice, but having shut out God from his rightful position of sovereignty, that means king of kings, he reigns in my heart. They place their dependence upon human power, which without God is worthless. The Savior took upon himself the infirmities and weaknesses of humanity, and he lived a sinless life so that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature they could not overcome. For Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature, and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. Guys, that's, that should be our whole goal. How do I become one with Christ? That's what was presented in 1888. Righteousness by faith was not doing away with the law, as many of our, our pioneers thought. Jones and Wagner actually said it exalts the law. It gives us power to do the law if Christ comes into the heart. Listen to what Ellen White says here. Not until the life of Christ beco- the life of Christ becomes a vitalizing, vitalizing. Take time to look at the words. Vitalize something means you, you put life and strength and energy into it. Not until the life of Christ becomes a vitalizing power in our lives can we resist the temptations that assail us from within and from without. Unless we accept the atonement provided for us in the remedial sacrifice of Christ, who is our atonement, our at one with God, those are her words, no genuine reform can be effected. Human barriers against natural and cultivated tendencies are but as the sandbank against the torrent. But by becoming one with Christ, man is made free. Amen. Subjection to the will of Christ means restoration to perfect manhood. Not halfway. Perfect manhood. Now I want to show you, this this is the most important part. This changed my life forever. This is what helped me and those that I've shared with be able to have victory like they've never had before over everything. Listen to this. Pay attention to this. And if you need this sent to you, send me an email and I'll send it to you. Not until... Actually, we did that one. I'm sorry. Here we go. After Jesus had been baptized by John in the Jordan, he went straightway up out of the water. The reason I'm showing you this is, how do I get in Christ? Right? When I saw this other stuff, I was like, that's the gospel. How come nobody told me this? It's not that nobody was, they weren't trying to keep it from us. God is pouring out His Spirit now and revealing these things to us like He did in 1888. I was sitting there and I was like, I've been quote unquote a Christian for 50 years. Where was this Bible study? And the Lord was like, It wasn't time yet, but now it is. How do I get in Jesus? Listen to this. After Jesus was baptized by John and Jordan, he went straightway up out of the water to the bank of the river, and he bowed in the attitude of prayer. Here he identifies himself with sinners as our representative. If you have a representative, they represent you. That means whatever is given to them is yours, and whatever is yours is theirs. Christ said, I'll take your sins, all of them, not just your sins, I'll take your fallen nature. I'll take the corrupt heart and mind, and I will give you 
my mind, my heart, my life, my victory. Ellen White says, every sin that we struggle with, Christ won the victory for us if we will claim it. But if you don't claim it in faith, you won't receive it. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord, James says. He here identifies himself with sinners as our representative. And in taking upon him our sins and numbering himself with transgressors. In his prayer, he came up out of the baptism and prayed. In his prayer, Christ with his human arm encircles fallen humanity, while with his divine arm, he is reaching for the throne of the infinite. His hands were raised upward, and his eyes were fixed as if penetrating heaven, and he poured out his soul in supplication to his Father to, for strength to meet the unbelief, the unbelief and sinfulness of men to break the power of Satan over man, and to be able to overcome Satan in behalf of man. What happened after Jesus was baptized? What's the very next event? He was sent by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. He said, God, I want to conquer every one of their personal sins. God said, you have to go to the wilderness for this to happen. When he came back from the wilderness, you know what he said? The kingdom of God is at hand. I reign, and if you will let me into your life, I will reign in you, and you will not fall. To break the power of Satan over man and to be able to overcome Satan in behalf of man, Jesus presented humanity before his Father, that means the human race, asking that God would grant to fallen man the light and strength and power from his own throne to successfully overcome the prince of the power of darkness. Never had angels listened to such a prayer. They were solicitous, ready and willing and eager to bear to the praying Redeemer messages of assurance and love. But no, the Father himself will minister to his Son. Direct from the throne proceeded the light of the glory of God. The heavens were opened and beams of light and glory proceeded therefrom. The people stood spellbound with fear and amazement. Their eyes were fastened upon Christ, whose bowed form was bathed in the beautiful light and glory that ever surround the throne of God. His upturned face this way was glorified as they had never before seen the face of man. The thunders rolled, and the lightnings flashed from the opening heavens, and a voice came therefrom in terrible majesty, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Christ just asked his Father, Father, will you accept all of humanity in me? This was God's answer. And the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, embraces all humanity. God spoke to Jesus as your representative and mine. With all our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless, for he is hath made us accepted in the beloved. The word beloved is who his son was, my well-beloved son. The glory that rested upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. The light which fell from the open portals of heaven upon the head of our Savior will fall upon us as we pray for help to resist temptation. The voice which spoke to Jesus says to every believing soul, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. That's Ellen White's words. I did not edit that. What God spoke to Jesus, he was speaking to every one of us. (coughs) Because Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, God chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world so that we could be holy 
and without blame before him in love. For we had the sentence of death in ourselves. The question came up yesterday about original sin. There's a difference between what the Bible says, what Ellen White herself believed and our pioneers, and what the Catholic Church believes. The Catholic Church believes that we are guilty for what Adam did. That's not the truth. But we are born sinners because of what Adam did. Our nature is sinful. There's no human being that has ever not sinned. Not one except Christ. And Ellen White said that's why he had to come. I'm going to give you a short example. I know everybody's tired. But this will stay with you. Let's say we lived here in the United States 200 years ago. 250 years ago. Down south, like where I live, uh, North Carolina, maybe farther south, Georgia. There's a plantation there. Large plantation. 1,000 acres. He's got 500 slaves. Okay? And I have no prejudice. So black or white, you all know that, right? Okay. But they're black people. It is terrible that that happened. 500 slaves. There's a man and a woman there that had been bought at separate times, but they had been there for a couple of years, and they're working together, and you get to know each other, and they decided, we want to get married. They fell in love. They love the Lord. They're slaves, but they fell in love, and they wanted to get married, and they know you can't get married as a slave. The, the master would not allow them. This master, I don't know if that's a rule, but this master would not allow them. So they snuck, and they had a wedding ceremony with some of the other slaves that were friends, and they got married. About a year later, the lady was going to have a baby. Is the baby born free or is the baby born a slave? I know it's food for thought, but you got to think about it for a moment. Is the baby born free or is it born a slave? Why? Exactly right. We, Adam, sold us into slavery. Ellen White even says that. Guys, I, I wrestled with this down in, in Oregon back a year ago. And people were like, they thought I was an absolute apostasy. And I showed them Ellen White's quotes. She said, we were born in sin. And then she quoted this, we had the sentence of death on ourselves. That baby that is born to that man and that woman, it had no choice. It had nothing involved in it. It was born in bondage because its parents were in bondage. The, Catholic, the Catholics say... That's why, and that's what Augustine taught, that's why no one can ever hope for having freedom. But do you know what Ellen White said? I love this. She said, Christ came and he signed the emancipation papers of the entire race. Romans, write this down. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 19 says almost the same thing in different words. Jesus said, I set them all free. So I'm going I'm to continue this parable. So here this man is, the father, his wife and baby are back somewhere on the plantation. He's out there, and it's 105 degrees, South Georgia. He's got chains on his ankles, a chain around his neck, you know, where they hook another chain to him. And he's out there in the sun breaking up rock. And this man comes riding by on a horse. And he looks over as he's passing by, and he's like, those were slaves. And he turned the horse around, and he comes back, and he's like, Brother, what are you doing with those chains on your, on your ankles? Why are you out here with that in the heat? Like He said, I'm working for the man. Uh, and he said, what do you mean you're working for the man? Are, are you being paid? Why do you have chains? I'm a slave. He says, did you not hear that Abraham Lincoln signed the papers a year ago? You're free. And the man says, I don't get to leave here. I don't go into town. I don't see the newspapers. I can't even read if I saw a newspaper. The man says, I've got a copy of the Declaration of Your Freedom right here. And he opens up the Emancipation Proclamation where Abraham Lincoln said, you're free. 
When Abraham Lincoln signed that paper, every slave was free, whether they knew it or not. Do you know what the devil does? Everything he can to keep you in blindness so that you don't know what was done at Calvary. Do you know what? That big, strong black man, faith takes hold. Something, the Spirit of God inside of him says, I trust this man on the horse. I know he's white, but I can forgive him for that. I trust him. And the man looks at him and says, take off the shackles. Do you know Isaiah 52 says that? Loose yourself from the bands of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. You have sold yourself for naught, but you have been redeemed without money. Amen. That man reaches down and throws the chains off like they're nothing because of faith. Because of faith. We had the sentence of death in ourselves so that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they already are. If you're in bondage to sin, God says, I set you free. Stand up and walk. If it's darkness, God speaks light. If there's leprosy, He speaks health. If there's wickedness, He speaks righteousness. Everything He does, He does through His Word. Write these verses down. Isaiah 45, verse 11 through 19, and Isaiah 63, verse 1. It actually says, I am the Lord. I speak righteousness and make things right. Isaiah 45, 11 through 19, and Isaiah 63, verse 1. For of God are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto you wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And you hath. Past tense, he quickened. Who were, past tense, dead in trespasses and sins. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavens. In Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might reveal the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ. Guys, I know it's been a long day. I may not see you before Christ comes. This is worth it. And you have to take, search for this. And I'm begging you, send me an email. Let me send you the articles. Start searching for everything that you can find. There's an article that was written, and I can send it by email, but if you have E.G. White's writings on CD-ROM, and if you don't have it, you ought to get it. They're only $20. Everything is at your fingertips, and it's so much faster than going through her website, okay? There's an article that was written from a a sermon um, from W.W. Prescott in 1895 in Australia, and Ellen White was there for the whole camp meeting. She said Prescott spoke more than 30 messages in that one camp meeting, and she said every message, she said, I have never seen the Spirit of God manifest on a man like this since 1888. She said there were Sunday-keeping pastors that were sending their deacons and secretaries and taking shorthand notes and going back on Sunday morning and preaching the sermons. She said he presented every truth and doctrine that we hold without ever mentioning the word doctrine. She said he presented everything in Christ. The one message he presented that I want you to read first, it's called the word was made flesh. When you read it, it will change your life. And Ellen White confirmed everything that he said. If you send me an email, I'll send you the four articles, three from Ellen White and one from Prescott. Um, E. Wilson, the number seven, TH, at gmail.com. If it takes me a week, don't get impatient. I I will reply. If you can put some kind of little note to help me remember who you are, that's even, or send a picture. I love that because that way I have a face with an email. I want you guys to keep my wife and I and my children in prayer, and I want you to know that every person here 
We are going to pray for you. From this day forward, every single day, you will be lifted in prayer and faith. You guys study to find out what happened at Calvary. And if you read the articles from Sister White, it floored me at what God had revealed. Because what he showed her, her understanding, progressed all the way up till the day that she died. I remember one comment she made after Wagner's presentation on the two covenants at 1888, and she wrote about it. She said, I heard Wagner present the two covenants, and she said, we may have been wrong on the way we viewed this before now. Do you know what the, the old advent looked at? They said old covenant was before Calvary, new covenant is after Calvary. Everybody believed that. And Wagner showed, no, the old covenant was in the Old Testament. Hagar and Sarah... One was by works, one was by faith. And Ellen White said, we may have been wrong. That doesn't lessen Ellen White's inspiration, but I'm telling you, God was leading her. Light progresses, and she says in her writings, there is yet great light to shine forth from the gospel of righteousness and the law of God. Yet, hallelujah. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for what you and what your son have done for us. Thank you for the gift of your presence, your spirit, and your power in our lives. Father, we need you. You promised in Isaiah that you will not rest, Lord Jesus Christ, until our righteousness shines forth like the sun. Make us yours, wholly yours. Father, we lift every family and every individual that is represented here this weekend, here at this church and all the churches that are here. Father, we lift every individual. Speak to them. Draw them to your word. Encourage them to read the promises with their names in it and read it out loud. Thank you, Father, for hearing and for answering. In Jesus' name, we believe and we receive. Amen.